Well, hello, folks, and welcome once again to the Joel Saint Show. I am Joel Saint, your host, father, grandfather, and pastor. And I want to encourage you, and the reason for this show, in part, in large part, is to help you enjoy and appreciate and apply the Word of God. Listen to what Psalm 119, for example, has to say about the Word of God. We, you know, we, we seem to go everywhere else. Why don't we go to the Word of God? Listen to Psalm 119. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Have you prayed that recently? Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Maybe you look into the Word of God and the law Word of God and you don't see wondrous things. I urge you to pray this prayer, Psalm 119 and verse 18. Open my eyes. That's a prayer that I may see wondrous things from your law. So what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about this issue that keeps coming up, this idea of, uh, sh shall we say, do I love my country? Uh, you know, do, do I love America? Uh, America for an awful lot of people is becoming this really bad place. You know, they have such horrible things to say about America. Uh, I, I seem to notice myself, as I've mentioned before, that an awful lot of people still want to seem to come here. And if America was as bad place as what people are saying it is, you would think they'd be like running out of here just as quickly as they could to some much better place. But I don't see that happening. So I want to talk about that very briefly. But my, my main goal here is, do we consider loving, let's say, America as a bad thing because if i say if i love america then that does that mean i don't love canada or mexico or guatemala or uruguay or moldova or whatever sorry if i forgot a continent right there ivory coast there i've got africa there you go so here here's the thing i don't believe in loving my country as much as i believe in loving my neighbor now, if we would all just love our neighbor, which the Bible tells us to do, and think about it for a moment, Christ said in Luke chapter 10 that loving one's neighbor is on the same level as loving God. He said the, the second one, the, the second commandment is like the first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second one's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So here's the thing. If we will love our neighbor as ourself, then we will have a country that where there's lot, an awful lot of love. I mean, think about it. If everybody in the nation or the state or whatever, if everybody were to do that, you would have plenty of love for the people that needed it. Remember, the Good Samaritan, we can't say the Good Samaritan was, you know, he, he went and he loved a person who was not part of his ethnic group, but it was a person that he came across. It was a person that he needed, uh, that needed his help. And the Good Samaritan helped the uh, Jewish person in the parable that Christ told. And as a result, he saved his life, the, the, the life of the Jewish person. Now, are we going to say that the Good Samaritan then did not love everybody else? He only was concerned about the, this Jewish person that he came across? No. Uh, we love those who we come across, those who, who need our help. I still remember this happened well over 10 years ago. It happened in our house where my sump pump went out during a major water storm and, or, you know, rainstorm, if you will, of course. And what happened was I asked my son-in-law to come over and help. And we were, we were actually dipping water in five gallon buckets and, and, and taking it out of where the sump pump normally would have pumped it out, but it wasn't running. And we were just taking, taking the buckets upstairs and dumping the water out, uh, right out of the uh, out of the garage, uh, out, out the front of the garage, I should say. And we were just trying to keep up, and another inch or two, and that water would have been begun to flood the basement. Well, we called someone to help us put in a uh, a pump that night, put in a, a working pump. We got a hold of someone, but I just did not have the money on hand to pay for it. Well, my son-in-law helped me out and lent us some money, which we paid him back a little bit later. And we got the job done. Now think about that for a minute. My son-in-law loved us, and there's no there's no government agency. I don't I don't care how 
how skillful you want to make this. There's no government agency that could do what my son-in-law did for us that night. You know, he knew us, we knew him, and we got the thing squared away that night and were able to pay for the new pump that night. Now, again, this is family welfare going on. This is love of one's neighbor. In his book called Intellectuals, Paul Johnson deals with this this idea of loving people in abstraction, if you will. Uh, I, I recently met a man who wanted to tell me that, yeah, I, I love everyone. I accept everyone. We hear this all the time, especially from leftists. I accept everyone. And the young man I was with, we asked him, I said, do you love the babies? Do you love the unborn babies? Well, he didn't love them. And, and so you know, he, he, he didn't even want to talk about that. Well, how do you love the unborn babies? Well, you certainly want to advocate that they don't get murdered in the womb or even out of the womb as we progress uh, down the d d down the bloodthirsty uh, road that we're, we're, we're going. And so I want to just come around here and address this idea, though, that like, is it is it wrong to love, let's say, America? Because is, is, is that what uh, Hitler did? You know, they loved the fatherland and, and that was the problem. Well, I would say that is a problem, but I certainly don't want to say that, that that he was the only one that did that. What we don't understand is that it wasn't just Hitler that was doing these kinds of things. The fatherland was kind of a big deal back in the those that mid-1900s. People talked about it all the time. And I want to give you an example here. This is from a book that I want to uh, read very briefly from. It's called, if you can see that, The Crimes of Stalin. And this, there's a young man here that I want to introduce you to. His name was Lev Kapolov. And he was part of the Soviet prosecution of the Ukrainians during what's called the Holodomor, if I'm saying that correctly, meaning, meaning execution by hunger, if you will, where, well, Solzhenitsyn believes that over 60 million people were killed in the Holodomor. Um, other people believe that there were less. In any case, it was the Soviet Union starving people to death on purpose. Now, I, wa I want you to hear a justification for this, because the author, Nigel Cawthorn of this book, says this. He says, those who carried out these atrocities, and the atrocities were, 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 were crazy. People, if they dug up a potato at night from their own garden, if they were caught, could get uh, sent off to, to camp or perhaps um, even, even killed on the spot. Well, maybe perhaps not on the spot, but had a trial and then, and then summarily shot. But there were people that carried out this great atrocity. It didn't happen on its own. Nigel Cawthorn says, those who carried out these atrocities were unconcerned about the people that they killed. Young communist activist Lev Kapolev, who scoured the countryside for hidden stores of grain, people hid the grain so that the uh, Soviets couldn't find it to, in order to eat and not starve to death. So many starved to death. And you can, you can find out more about this. In fact, I recently went online and found out, uh, you know, saw a whole lot of uh, newspaper pictures of people just, people just starved. It, it, was, it, it was awful. But again, they were starved on purpose. Young communist activist Lev, Kop Lev Kopolev, who scoured the countryside for hidden stores of grain, wrote a blithe account of his heartless activities. He says, quote, I saw women and children with distended bellies turning blue, with vacant eyes and corpses in ragged sheepskin coats and cheap felt-booted corpses in peasant huts in the snow of old Volagoda, under the bridges of Kharkov. But Nigel Cawthorn goes on to say, but he managed to justify the suffering he had seen. And this is Kopolov again. He says, we were realizing historical necessity. We were performing our revolutionary duty. We were obtaining grain for the socialist fatherland. I emptied out the old folks' stores' chest, stopping my ears to the children's crying and women's wails. I was convinced I was accompanying the great and necessary transformation of the countryside. So here is a man, and that's the end of the quote there. Here's a man who's saying, I'm doing the best thing for the fatherland. And what am I doing as I do the best thing for the fatherland? I am destroying my neighbor. Do you see how powerful and strong the idea of loving one's neighbor is? You know, loving one's neighbor is not something that comes out of, it's just something we naturally know. 
uh, just tell that to the folks who died in the Holodomor when the um, when the Soviets were killing them off, starving them to death, in the name of doing the right thing, in the name of the fatherland. So, for me at least, as a pastor and as a father, what do I teach my children, grandchildren? I teach them to love their neighbor. Again, if we can learn how to love our neighbor as ourselves, then we won't have to worry so much about the fatherland and about the country and the nation and so forth because you would have a whole nation. I don't care if it's America or what it is. You would have a whole nation of people who are loving their neighbor. And in loving your neighbor, if we could think about it, if we could all love our neighbor, we would definitely have enough love to go around. But of course, nowadays, if, if you say, I love people, I'll save my own race. Let's say, I mean, it, it, this is crazy, right? If I say, I love white people, I mean, that's like a bad thing, right? Well, I, I might love a, a white person who is my neighbor. Uh, I have been loved as a white person by other people of all kinds of all kinds of ethnic backgrounds, if you will. So, well, I want to share just one more verse with you. This is from Nehemiah, because Nehemiah talks about the the, the fact that the uh, children of Israel were were under under attack, and they had to they had to defend themselves when they were rebuilding the wall when they came back from Jerusalem. Now, remember, they came back, or not, or excuse me, back from Babylon after seventy years. They began to come back just as Jeremiah had predicted in his prophecy. And Daniel was aware of this. He prayed in Daniel 9. He read Jeremiah and he understood they were supposed to come back because he studied the Bible there, Jeremiah, the Word of God there in Jeremiah. They come back and remember, all they began to do was build a wall. Just the fact that they began to build a wall really annoyed their enemies because their enemies could not oppress them any longer. Now, again, and I don't want to get into this too much, but think about this. They just went back, they built a wall, and their enemies want to kill them for it. They, they weren't attacking them. They weren't stealing their stuff. They weren't burning down their villages. They weren't killing them. They weren't selling them into slavery. All they were doing was building a wall to protect themselves, and that, that, that annoyed their enemies to the point where they wanted to kill them. And they threatened to kill the uh, Jews coming back from Babylon. And Nehemiah speaks up, and people are getting, getting scared, if you will. They're, 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 they're in fear. And Nehemiah encourages them, and he says this. He says, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight. Listen to this. Fight for your brethren your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. So our first neighbors are our own families. And he's saying, everybody, fight for your own family and fight for your houses. This is another problem we have. No property is worth dying for or killing for is what they'll say. You know, if you, if you can retreat, uh, uh, you, you know, go ahead and retreat, I guess run through your house and out the back door and into the, into the creek. I, you know, this is this is crazy nonsense that's going on. I, I saw a, I, I, I heard, shall we say, and read of a decision by, I think, the Minnesota Supreme Court that said that if you can reasonably back up, even if it's in your own house, you should do that if someone's threatening you. And if you defend yourself, then you're the one that could be liable. I think I have that correct. Well, not for not for Nehemiah here. He says, fight for your wives, your houses. And what he means by that is he means fight and be ready to kill. I, again, in this kind of situation, if, you talk, if you're talking about fighting, you're talking about killing. That's, that's, that's what it's talking about. And it is legitimate to fight for your house. Yes, your physical property. But again, starting with your neighbor. Now, this is an act of loving one's neighbor here to fight for their life. It's, it's an act of absolute love. And what happened was, and historically, when Nehemiah got everybody ready to fight, they they backed off. Their enemies backed off. And there was no fight because they were ready. There, there was no war. There was no battle because they were ready to fight. So a lot more could be said on that. Just want to talk briefly about the idea of fighting for your country, 
fighting for the fatherland. I will tell you that some of that is kind of fuzzy for me. Fight for your country. I don't recognize the country that I grew up in anymore. I, 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 I just don't. It seems like everything that I value is mocked and everything that we should be ashamed of as a country is now promoted as some good thing. So it's hard for me to actually identify what it means to fight for your country or my country. That's hard. I sure don't want my sons, grandsons, daughters now, granddaughters, fighting in, in some of these crazy wars where we've got going on around the country where we're just bombing people and sending in troops here, there, and everywhere. And I am concerned about what's going on, frankly, in Europe right now. It seems like things are escalating there. I, I mean, really, let's, let's say they want, they want us to fight for Israel or fight for the Ukraine. Is that, is that seriously fighting for your country? Just because a politician says that this, this is fighting for your country if you go over, uh, overseas and fight? I, don't, I can't get my arms around that anymore, if I ever could. Tell you what I can get my arms around. I can get my arms around loving my neighbor and fighting for my family. That I can under get my arms around. That I can understand. Well, I hope this video was helpful. I want to remind you, if you haven't signed up yet for the Future of Christendom Conference on October 11th and 12th, we urge you to do that. And right away, just drop everything and get this done. It is a conference like no other. At this particular conference, you will hear from people who have actually been in the fight. You will hear from pe people who have done more than talk. I think of my friend, for example, Ron Kranz, Pastor Ron Kranz. He'll be there speaking. And he has been in Washington, D.C. for a long time. And he's been mocked, attacked, because he's been out there promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Washington, D.C. area where Christ is mocked and hated. But he's been out there, and he has the scars. There's other men. Uh, Pastor Matt Truella, for example, spent time in jail way back in the day and fearlessly proclaims, he's the author of the book, The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates, fearlessly proclaims the Word of God in uh, to our politicians and to our elected officials. So you'll hear from people that, or more than just talk. You can go to a lot of conferences and you can hear how bad things are and hear how we need to stand up and we need to fight. Well, at this conference, you'll hear from people who do fight. And you'll understand that when you fight and when you speak up and when you get out there in the arena, there's going to be people that uh, are going to take shots at you. There's, there are people that are going to call you names. There are, going to people that are going to, there are people that are going to try to silence you. And people have tried to silence this conference. That's another reason why you should come, this Future of Christendom con conference. Because there's a lot of conferences no one's trying to silence. But they've tried to silence us more than once and more than twice. So the more they try to silence us, the more reason for you to come and hear from those men who have been in the battle. That's the Future of Christendom Conference. You can find more, find out more at futureofchristendom.org. And I urge you to come. And I certainly would like to make your acquaintance there. Well, thanks for, thanks for listening. Thanks for being with us or with me. And I, if you like what you're hearing here, I hope you like. I hope you subscribe. Comment if you like. We'll have more coming your way. And I hope you have a... A wonderful day, a blessed day, wherever you are. Thank you again. So very, very good to be with you.